and welcome to the New World Review. I'm Grandline Waifu and we are at episode 143 of Hunter x Hunter and I simply do not understand how I went from episode 1 to here but you know what, let's not think about it for now. Instead we're going to look at this picture of a panda and question why the panda is Jing. No really, why is Jing a panda in the opening of 143? A runoff vote's happening and I guess I'm confused as to why people are voting for Jing because he's not there. And why more people aren't voting for Biscuit? I mean, Biscuit. Honestly, I think Biscuit could be the best choice for the head of the Hunters Association. She's fair, she's sort of kind sometimes, and she's great at massage, which is really all the reasons I want someone to be the head of an association that I am a part of. Any association. Anyway, episode 143, if it had a theme, was one of rules, miscommunication, and cruelty. Oh, and Hisoka confused as hell about what to do. The thing I still don't fully understand about something is how something talks to Kiwa with eyes and how Kiwa knows the difference between Alaka and something given the differences... The similarities? I mean, when when something has eyes, something is Alaka. But something calls Kiwa Kiwa when something is something. I really don't like that that sentence made sense. I am absolutely right. In my view, Kilwa's not human. I've been saying this since we saw his spear hands in the first arc, but let it be known that the fifth rule, the one to do with Kilwa, has to do with actual siblings. It must, surely, truly. Because Kilwa has such a protective streak about this particular sibling, and we don't see Kilwa's assassination techniques as anything less than superhuman in a way that we can kind of see the others. I mean... Illumi, uh, he's just kind of high. Those eyes? Like, whoo, hello, eyes. I don't know about that guy, really. I don't know about Illumi, but any dude that can go through a puffer jacket stage has to be human because no one, no, no, no self respecting alien is going to, like, wear a puffer jacket. And to my mind, it makes sense that Illumi is just trying to edgelord his way through life. Why? Because he looks like he's trying to edgelord his way through life. His dislike of Alaka and his fear that Alaka's going to kill everyone while dealing with Gon is strong. But only a few episodes in, we've managed to undercut his primary reason for chasing Kilwa. I don't want to say the clarification of this mini arc was underwhelming, but it's somewhat an underwhelming conclusion. It's sort of in the same vein as having Hisoka talk to camera, which he did today as if he were in an ad on assassination. Which is great from a visual perspective, but because we knew it was Hiski going around killing everyone, it added nothing to the narrative and added nothing to the overall visual energy of the piece. If anything, that moment slowed the scene down slightly and I didn't really like the chat to Cam. On its own, I could have seen Hiski's moment being a really good ad for the episode, to be honest, but put it in this context and I was less than entertained by it, despite my obvious adoration of all things Hisoka. There are a few things happening in this arc that show us we're trying to finish it up quickly, but because of the increasingly long arcs that have happened, there's a sense of narrative whiplash. In the past, information would be given and we'd have time to come to terms with it, but now the manliest man who ever manned, the bigly strong man with the expensive chin, is dead, and I never really understood what was going on beyond the black guy being like, yeah, they're both stupid and this is dangerous, in response to their political views. I guess what I don't understand is what kind of hunter any of those three are or were, and maybe I I don't need to, but with most hunters up to now, I've had a sense of what it was they were interested in, or that they could do before they died. But this guy, the one who died on the phone to the waterbender, I've forgotten what his name is, and I've been watching Avatar, I'm sorry. Uh, he was like old Gil from The Simpsons, just saying, oh, my wife is gonna kill me, please buy something. Look, I'll pay you to buy something, please. Can I use your name? I guess the thing that surprises me about it is the idea that Hisoka bothered to do it himself. I don't know who else would have. Illumi really only has Hisoka to do anything useful, but at the same time is this situation that Hisoka's created really useful to anyone? As he arrived at the building, I said under my breath, oh, Hiski's bored. And it really strikes me as a boredom kill, not a strategic kill. What is it that Hiski stands to gain from this? Illumi is on a watch list, Hisoka is not. At the end of the day, I suppose Hisoka's trying to get the ultimate fight, but I suspect his own emotions around what that is or what that looks like or how to get it are confused because killing Alaka would have got him an ultimate fight but first between Kilwa and himself and then Illumi and himself but is it the ultimate fight? Is Gon still going to be the best fight he's ever had? I'm not sure and I'm not sure he is which was the most interesting thing about the situation to me. Hisoka's goals and motivations have fluctuated throughout the whole series and I find it odd that so close to achieving his goal of fighting Gon he's not helping that outcome occur. I'm even more surprised that it seems to be a result of friendship with Illumi and care of Kilwa cutting his way through everyone seems to be a pastime that he's taken up to release tension, but not in the same way as it did during the Hunter exam, so maybe everyone has grown in some way? To be honest, I'm not sure if 
its growth or inconsistency, but now that a number of people are dead and Alok is en route to gone, while Kilwa has made a point and Teradine is dead, let's take a look at 144 because it feels as though Hisoka killing Teradine was just to speed up the arc rather than for any internal motivation. And that's, yeah. 144 and we have to love a heartfelt speech, don't we? I mean, we don't, we don't, but it tugged at my heartstrings in a pleasing way. Leorio explaining how he felt and what he wanted from the situation was really all anyone needed to know. I like that this is the way we're seeing Leorio and I like that this is the way he's being used narratively within the context of the show. He's always been the character with passion, so the passion is being used to its fullest. And unlike my issues with Hisoka, this is possibly the most Leorio appropriate action and situation for Leorio to be in, especially given his backstory. There's a solid understanding here that Leorio could win and the reason he would win is the reason he's won up till now. That beyond anything, he cares about his friends. Either that or the Bacchanalian experiences he's described beyond being a doctor. I really appreciate that this is a show that doesn't hide from the reality of being an adolescent. My friend was squaring up against horrific creatures and what was I doing? Jerking off and spending time with women. Oh yes. That's probably why Leorio is so angry at Gon's dad. I mean, beyond all the other reasons. Even in a situation where Gon could have had a normal life. Like, if he dies, his dad won't have even gone to see him. So he doesn't even get a normal experience of death. And that really annoys Leorio, whose bedside manner, based on what he said in that speech, would actually be pretty impeccable. The idea that he won't stop talking to people and that that behaviour is the thing people often want, someone who's going to care about them if they're hurt or disappear. That's what the hunters in the room need and that's what they want. The underground situation is equally interesting and important because it makes me wonder whether Pariston was the one who set up the ants to take over in the first place. At the very least, if anyone knew where that guy was that the ants were looking for, it would be Pariston. Unless it is him. Maybe it is. And would that be so bad? No, it would tie up a lot of loose ends, if I'm honest, which we really need since there are only four episodes left. So we'll take what we can get, right? The idea that Jing tried to leave and Cheadle, that's Dog Lady's name, and I never took it in, and by now you know that I never will. Sorry, Cheadle. Cute name, but it'll go. But Cheadle's attempt to force the end of the voting is an unexpected shift for the major players here and it probably is going to result in even more issues because it means there are less people around to make sure Alec is safe, right? Anyone who would have voted either didn't know or didn't care about Gone, and anyone who wasn't there to vote either didn't know or didn't care about the vote or has higher priorities. And thanks to the change in how the voting's being carried out, the game that Ying, Natero and Pariston play is being pushed into the third act of the arc instead of dragging out. So while narratively it looks like this was deliberate, it also has the benefit of speeding up the arc. And I have a lot of thoughts on this, but I'm not entirely sure how to clarify them without seeing the rest of the series. So we'll do that and then talk about the pacing of this arc because I'm still flip-flopping on how I feel about it. One thing I really appreciated was the fact that everyone Gon has interacted with on any meaningful level was here to look after him. If Bisky hadn't been out of the running, would she have been there? I'm not sure, but I'd be surprised if she hadn't simply abandoned the voting in order to go look out for Gon. I'm not sure, without Illumi there, who or what is being protected at this point, so I'm interested to see what happens with that because I don't know how much danger everyone's in if the wishing is undertaken correctly. Kilwa made it to Gon and he's there to fix things up and I guess the next question is whether it works and whether Gon is grateful for any of what's been done to help him. But that's something I need to keep watching to know, so that's it for me. We're getting close to the end now, so there are only so many more times I'm going to say click here, here and here. Make sure you get some sweet treats or savoury if that's your preference. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe and I'll see you next time.